And now we hear from the Commonwealth of, of Massachusetts. <laughs> what state are we in? <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, John it's Kingsdale, the Executive Director of the Commonwealth Health Insurance, Connector Authority, and Rosemary Day, Deputy Director. Thank you so much. And uh, we've heard a lot about this program for, for the last few years, and it's great to see you make a presentation today. Well, thank you for this opportunity and for a fascinating day. I am acutely aware that we are all that stands between you and cocktails, so we will be brief. 97.4% um, of Massachusetts has health insurance, by far the highest rate in the U.S. As a result, our residents are far more likely uh, to see a doctor. And by contrast, uh, it's estimated that some 20,000 Americans die each year for lack of insurance. These are not just statistics, uh, but real people like Jacqueline Michaelis. She is uh, with us today. Hi, Jacqueline. Um, because Massachusetts requires that adults get coverage and provide subsidies, uh, insurance subsidies as well. Jacqueline lost her insurance when she stopped teaching in 2003. And several years later, she uh, felt a lump in her breast, but she did not uh, pursue that because of costs. In 2007, she got uh, coverage through the connector had a physical, was referred to a specialist who did a biopsy and treated her cancer. Um, a year and $100,000 of paid claims later, Jacqueline was back coaching field hockey at uh, Norwood High School, and without health reform, uh, she might not be here today with us. As you, you know, sure. You keep looking at her. <laughs> As you know, Americans have tried many times to reform health care. So how did Massachusetts do it? In pursuit of something that in the United States is often castigated as socialism, or worse, um, we took a pragmatic, non-ideological, and bipartisan approach. The theme of Massachusetts health reform, shared responsibility, embodies this bipartisan approach. So does the organization of the connector as a hybrid public-private entity harnessing the market to serve public policy ends. And to give you a few examples of those principles of shared responsibility and private-public partnership, uh, Rosemary Day, the Connector COO, will jump in here. So shared responsibility truly defines our approach, which brings together the theme of individual responsibility and community participation. The Health Connector has made shared responsibility more than just rhetoric. We helped to build a campaign to support the implementation of the law that mobilized employers, consumers, and insurers. As a result, 43% of the 432,000 newly insured Massachusetts residents are privately funded. That means that their employers are paying for them or they're paying for it on their own. Government is not paying for them. The shared responsibility theme is so important that a study documenting shared financing was recently released at a State House celebration of health reform's third anniversary. A key component of shared responsibility is actually the individual mandate, which requires Massachusetts residents to buy health insurance if they can afford it. This has actually never been done in the United States, so it was really important for us to implement this correctly. We've done this by taking a constructive and generous approach to our rulemaking and the handling of any appeals. In addition, we launched a strong and positive outreach campaign, letting everybody know about these new opportunities, and we tapped great private sector partners, including the Boston Red Sox. As a result of that, support for the individual mandate rose six percentage points in surveys of Massachusetts voters. It's now at 58% favorability. Another distinctive feature of the connector, as John mentioned, is that we were set up as a public-private entity. We're actually an authority, so we're government-sponsored, but we're expected to run like a business, which means we have to raise our revenue and become self-supporting. This actually gave us more flexibility than traditional state agencies have, and as a former Medicaid chief operating officer, I can attest that this made a huge difference. It was key to our ability to ramp up rapidly. But it also gives us credibility in the marketplace. For example, when we talk to insurers about selling their products through the Health Connector, the we includes the former senior vice president for sales at one of the largest HMOs in Massachusetts. 
Our single most effective tool is our website at mahealthconnector.org. Check it out. It's extremely usable. It gives consumers the information they need in a simple way so they can comparison shop health insurance plans in a matter of minutes. In fact, 80% of our applications come in online. So we're truly the travelocity of state-approved private health insurance. <laughs> and we're using this powerful market tool to serve a public purpose. In addition to covering more people, controlling costs are definitely key, and we've done that by beating expectations in our subsidized program with a 4.7% rate of premium increase through 2010, which is half of the industry trend. So as a result of effective implementation of shared responsibility and partnering with the private sector, public support for health reform has actually increased since the law passed from 61% to 69%, and we're told that's highly unusual. I'll turn it back to John, who will talk about transferability. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, the distinctive elements of our program, particularly individual mandate, uh, insurance market reform, and government sponsorship of the exchange, have been incorporated into virtually every national health insurance proposal that is now being seriously considered in Washington. And these elements were key to, the, to California's brave effort in 2007, sponsored by its Republican governor, and it's uh, passed by its Democratic General Assembly. Interest is so widespread uh, that I had to excuse myself uh, earlier from part of this afternoon's session uh, to participate in a conference call with two dozen states on exchanges and how they work. Now, the conferees also heard from Utah, uh, which is beginning its own exchange and which uh, last month came for a two-day site visit to Massachusetts to learn how we do it. So I think we have some valuable lessons to teach and to be learned, and I think the nation is eager to learn from them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Ed, and then, of course, David. I'm looking at, Carl. I'm, I'm looking at page four of your uh, narrative uh, in which you estimate that uh, roughly 200,000 people will be eligible for Comcare and that another eight to 900,000 will be eligible or will participate uh, in ComChoice. That's, if those figures are right, that means roughly a million people, uh, additional people seeking access to medical services in Massachusetts. How does that affect access? Okay, you, you've got the numbers right, but they're a little apples and oranges. So the 200,000 or so eligible for the subsidized Commonwealth care are typically uninsured. Right. Uh, 800,000 or so eligible for non-group and small group, that's the size of the market. And most of those people actually already are insured. They can decide to buy through okay. our marketplace, but typically they are already uh, insured, uh, unless they're part of the 2.6% okay. uninsured of the whole okay. state. I understand. Thank you. Excellent. David. Uh, as a resident of Massachusetts, I want to thank you for what you're doing. It's incredibly important. Um, and I want to delve into the uh, individual mandate a little bit. Um, I know in the first year the fine was negligible if you did not buy health insurance. But uh, last year in 2008, if I had not bought health insurance, what kind of tax penalty would, I've, would I have paid this spring? Was it up to $1,000 or something? Um, it's almost that. It, it, it varies with your income, and actually there's a cut between below age 27 and above because it's related to premiums, and premiums are age-adjusted. But if you were without insurance all year and were in the maximum sort of income age bracket, it would be $912. For and the is it going to go up in the future? So it goes up with premium trends, so, okay. and also we added drug coverage, so it'll be just over $1,000. So I'm just curious. I had initially expected there would be backlash against that, yeah. and, and I have seen none in the media. And I'm just curious, uh, do you think we have proven that you can do this uh, and get up to 98% without a backlash, or do you think that test is still a little bit out in the future? Well, you know, it's dangerous to generalize from one state's experience to the national experience. Um, we used to have a talk radio host here who uh, overturned uh, a seatbelt law. Um, you may remember Jerry Williams. Uh, and I'm glad he's no longer on the air uh, now that we started the mandate. But. Um, Frankly, we expected uh, more of a, of a negative response than uh, we actually have experienced so far. Um, we are going into a, a deep 
depression, a recession, and so that may exacerbate things. So I don't want to be overly optimistic, but I think we have done it, and particularly with the leadership of the governor, who um, is very sensitive that the appeals process, which the connector runs, be robust and generous. We've done it in a way that I think communicates we're not about trying to penalize you or get you. We're actually trying to convince you, to persuade you to do what's good for yourself, which is have coverage and protection. Carl? And then Mar Maria? Uh, as you alluded to, I mean, you bear a, a, a very heavy burden because the entire country is sort of looking at Massachusetts and how it, how it works. And I, could you clear up the, this the issue of costs and the, not so much the cost to individuals, although that's a cost too, but the cost to the state. Um, and when we talk about national health insurance, we all talk about how expensive it's going to be, even a, a model like Massachusetts. And we've heard that the Massachusetts uh, uh, costs are greater than initially anticipated. Massachusetts, like other states now, face a very, very serious budget deficit. And I realize that Massachusetts can't control health care costs the way presumably the nation can control costs. But how do you address this issue of cost containment within Massachusetts? And can you sustain this program absent a national program giving, given rising costs? So you've asked a very broad question. And I'm going to um, ask Rosemary to jump in when I don't answer everything. Um, but a couple of thoughts. One is. Uh, you know, estimating budget for a new program is a little like throwing darts in a bar after you've had a lot too much to drink. Um, <laughs> and so there was an estimate of $725 million for 2009. At some point, growth looked like it would, might put us way in excess of that. We're actually coming in about $800 million, which um, given three years out into a new program with people throwing darts at what the budget cost might be is really actually not too bad. But the broader question is, how can we afford to cover everyone? And um, in the broadest sense, the answer is we are holding the uninsured hostage to cost containment. So Massachusetts has not exacerbated our cost issues. They're severe, as they are nationally. We've not exacerbated them by covering the last 7, 8, 9 percent uninsured. In fact, the estimate for the nation is it would cost 5 percent more than the $2.5 trillion currently being spent on health care to cover the 50 million uninsured. But we do have this attitude that it ought to be self-financing, that somehow we have to control costs before we bring the last one-sixth of our population under coverage. And in some ways, I would argue the opposite, that what we're seeing in Massachusetts is now that we've got everybody under the tent, People are kind of understanding that the moral imperative to cover everyone leads smack into cost containment, that we are confronting that dead on. And we are having the most serious conversation and discussions about cost containment, I think, in this state, in the country. Uh, a special legislative committee is about to recommend a very radical change in the way we pay providers uh, to the legislature as our solution to cost containment. So we're not there, but um, we've actually elevated the issue by um, sort of eliminating the last, the only cost containment we as a country have, which is every year we throw a few million more people on the rolls of the uninsured, and that's what we call cost containment. We sort of excluded that option. We have no choice now but to confront it. Yes, Maria. Um, it's going back to David's point about the, the fine. So if it's up to about $900, um, the c cost of insurance, Average is average what for a 40-year-old in good health, let's say? Well, um, for an individual about 40, you could get insurance for about $2,500, $3,000 a year that meets our minimum standards. The, you probably would be shocked to learn that the average family pays 20% of median income for insurance. They not, may not pay it directly, but their employer is paying for it. I mean, it, the costs are huge, but $2,500, So, so I'm a 40-year-old, and I decide I'm going to take my chances on getting hit with a fine and that I don't get really ill this year. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so thoughts about, I mean, 
how how that sort of self interest i mean you want that healthy 40 year old yeah. paying that premium to average out the cost of the 45 year old who's not very healthy right right that's right and so the individual mandate by creating this penalty does that so not only is the 40 year old in your example who doesn't buy insurance uh, liable for a huge expense uh, but also he or she is paying a thousand dollars a year for the privilege of not having any coverage so that you know increases the likelihood in fact want, we've seen more of the increase in employer sponsored insurance come from employees taking an existing offer that they had previously refused because why pay you know hundred dollars a month if you think you're healthy well that calculus, calculus uh, turns around when you think, okay, I get coverage, and if I don't, I pay $80 a month in penalty. Um, and so we've seen more of the uptake come from existing employer offers than actually from new employers, uh, new, or from employers newly offering insurance. So that's, it's sort of a trickle-up theory of the individual mandate, if you will. I, I, and this may be an unfair question, but we had from Florida okay, you uh, take this one. another <laughs> presentation about health <laughs> <laughs> in which uh, you've now covered up to 90% of the people in your county um, with not much additional cost. Um, and so you may have been here for their presentation, but I think it's an interesting idea that they've gotten so close without additional cost. Maybe they're covering different things. Maybe they're doing it a different way. I'd just love you to comment on that. I guess it's unfair because then you guys don't get to comment on their thing, but well, I, I think that's, why, I, that's what we have cocktails for. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, the Business Supported Mass Taxpayers Foundation just did a, released another, we're being studied all the time, just released a study that said actually uh, there's been surprisingly little additional cost when you look at the whole state budget uh -huh. net net, um, and I think it was under $100 million. Um, when they looked at it per year, because we have one thing we didn't highlight, it's in the materials, but the, um, we are repurposing a lot of free care dollars. Uninsured people aren't free. Yeah. So we're taking that money and then putting some on top of it, joint federal and state funds. And then employers have kicked in a lot, as John talked about. So it's actually not that much additional cost when you think about it statewide. And I think you calculated per person. Well. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's real money, we'll put it that way. But it's, it's not the full by any means the full cost of, it's not all incremental costs. Um, a lot of it is coming from employers, a lot of it is coming from shifting free care subsidies over to insurance. Well, thank you. Is there any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Um, that was really good to hear.